Hello, and welcome to the Centennial Issue, Volume 100 of Capital Ideas Live. In today's issue, we'll discuss a new focus by the IRS that may affect forest owners. We'll talk about a bug that loves to eat kudzu. We'll find out what makes trees valuable, and we'll discuss the recent wildfires out west. I'm Hayes Brown, the General Counsel of the Alabama Forest Owners Association, and I'll be your host for today's discussion. You may have read of the wildfires in the West. Uh, this year the focus was on Colorado. It's unfortunately a recurring problem, and we wanted to find out why it was such a recurring problem from Sterling Burnett, who's a senior fellow at the National Center for Policy Analysis. Hello, Sterling. Hello. Good to be on. Why have these wildfires grown, grown so large? Well, you know, we hear a lot, we've heard a lot about the Colorado wildfire, but actually far more of uh, acres have been burned in, say, Montana, where over a million acres are burned in its main fire. Uh, and they are becoming more frequent and more severe, largely due to historic and present uh, government policies. Much of the land, I would argue too much of the land out west, where most of these fires occur, uh, are owned and managed by the federal government, and they uh, mismanaged, basically. We've had uh, the Smokey the Bear... Uh, campaign was largely successful, so the government suppressed fires, uh, natural wildfires that occurred for years and years and years, and um, for some purposes that's good, but for other reasons not so good. Uh, it, it allowed the density of forest to build up. Now, uh, during and pre-Reagan era, we were logging quite a bit more than we are doing now. Uh, we went from 12.5, 12, uh, I forget whether it's million or billion board feet under Reagan per year to, to right now it's under, it's under two. So we've fallen off sixfold and well, uh, fires have people, increased over the same time period. Some people have blamed overlogging in the past for the current wildfire plague. Is, is that fair? Well, it can't explain. You could say that the lack of logging only correlates with the increased wildfires. Uh, at the same time, they've reduced logging. They've also closed a lot of forest roads, which leaves less access for firefighters to get in there early. Um, but it can't really be uh, blamed on overlogging because you have forests, both private forest and state forest, adjoining these national forests. Um, and the wildfires don't start there, <laughs> and the wildfires don't burn as badly there when they hit them, and those forests recover much faster than the national forests, and that's because, and that's despite even more logging on those forests. The commercial forests and the state forests uh, do much more logging than the federal forest. What do you think and the yet, steps? What, what do you think the steps need to be to, to reduce the threat of wildfires over the long term? Well, you know, one of them is, uh, first we've got to talk the short term, because the fires happen every year, and, mm -hmm. and one of those steps is to increase the amount of logging allowed on national forests. Um, that, and that will require both uh, a change in administrative policy from the administration, but it would also require a change in law that would, res that would limit the ability of environmentalists to challenge and challenge again and challenge again forest uh, management policies. So they set a forest plan by professional foresters and the management at individual forests, and these forest plans are continually challenged. Even if the environmentalists lose, they try and find a different uh, way to hold it up, and they've been largely successful, and while they've done this, the fires have continued to burn. Okay. Well, thank you, Sterling. We appreciate that. Thank you. Our, our next guest will speak on the fundamental question of what makes a softwood tree valuable. He's Jack Lutz, and he's principal and forest uh, economist at the Forest Research Group. Welcome, Jack. Thank you. Good to be here. What are the most important factors to determine the value of a southern pine tree? Well, the, the two things with southern pine, uh, the overwhelming things are the size of the tree and the location of the tree. Oh, well, um, what about the quality of the tree? Yeah. That's a good question. It's, it's, in many ways, it's far less important with southern pines than with hardwoods. Uh, one of the reasons is that 
a lot of the southern pines are being grown in plantations, uh, probably most of them. Uh, they're relatively uniform in size and shape, and they're fairly young. You don't have an old forest where rot has set in, so that uh, the trees coming out of the southern forests are fairly uniform in size and shape and quality, and so it's, it's less of an issue. Okay, so to be clear, we're talking about uh, southern pine trees, uh, not hardwood trees. And one of the things you mentioned was size. How does size affect value? Well, for the most part with southern pine, the size of the tree determines the product class, whether it's going to be pulpwood or saw timber. And pulpwood logs are generally worth uh, much less than saw timber trees. So it, it, it's basically the size. Um, in, in other pl- parts of the world, other parts of the country, and in other species, a, um, the, a big tree is not necessarily a high-quality tree, whereas with southern pine, if it's a big tree, it's going to make lumber. It will be valuable. Okay, and size is something that mankind can affect, I guess. But your second thing was location. Yes. Um, Yes, it's it's all nice to have big trees, but if they're on a relatively dry spot in the midst of a swamp and you can't build a bridge or a road across the swamp to get to the trees, they really don't have a lot of value. Um, the, uh, one way to look at it is you don't own timberland in a geographic uh, unit like a county or a state. You own your trees within say 50 or 100 miles of a, of a collection of mills. And if you have a lot of pulp mills and some chip and saw mills and some saw mills and some other things, you've got a good market for your trees. And if you've only got one pulp mill and one saw mill, uh, that, those are the only places you can sell them. So the trees aren't going to be quite as valuable. Okay. It's important consideration if you're acquiring new forest land, I suppose. Yes. Okay. Yes. There's, there's not much you can do about where you own your forest <laughs> land now. All right. Um, what uh, you, you contribute to a publication called the Forest Research Notes, and um, uh, you have some charts in there that uh, our listeners could could link to. What are those charts show? Yeah, there's two two of the charts, and this uh, they were uh, printed in the last issue of Capital Ideas. Um, the first one shows how the volume of the stand varies over its age, and it shows how it starts out as pulpwood, and then some of the trees become chip and saw size, and some become saw timber. And the next chart shows if you take some timber prices and apply them to those values, and you'll find that uh, saw timber will make up a certain percentage of the volume on the stand, but it usually makes up a much higher percentage of the value of the stand. And, some of the examples are uh, it, at age 25, uh, it might saw timber might make up a third of the stand's volume, but it might would probably make up uh, a half of the stand's value. Or if at age uh, 30, a stand might be half saw timber in volume, but it might be three quarters of the value is is uh, due to the saw timber in it. Okay. All right. Well, thanks, uh, Jack. We appreciate that contribution. Brian Hendricks is with the Alabama Forestry Commission and contributes to an annual publication called Alabama Forest Resource Report, has all sorts of facts and figures about the current state of Alabama's forest, and so we asked him to give us a sneak peek uh, on that report. Hello, Brian. Hello. Uh, Brian, how does the the total timberland acreage uh, and timber volumes today compare with, say, the year 2000, well, over 10 years ago? Well, first let me start off by saying that Alabama ranks third in the nation in timberland acreage behind only Oregon and Georgia. Mm -hmm. Now, as far as acreage goes, it's changed very little since 2000, but volume has increased a good bit. Um, Softwood volume, which is mostly your pines, has increased by 19.3%. And your hardwood volume has increased by 5.6%. When you speak of volume, you're talking about of standing trees that are still out there. Yes. Mm Mm-hmm. And, yes, standing live trees. Um, Now, one reason for the big increase in softwood volume is due to the fact that there are considerably more acres of planted loblolly pine now than there were in 2000. And an interesting statistic to note is that since 2000, um, planted loblolly pine acreage has increased from 4.3 million to 5.5 million acres. That's an increase of almost 30%. And most of that increase comes from forest land that had previously consisted of hardwoods in the oak hickory forest type. Okay. 
Um, what is the economy, the struggling economy? What impact has it had on the on the forest resource? Well, there, there's no doubt that the economy has contributed, um, at least in part, to the increase in timber volume. Um, because new houses aren't being built, the demand for lumber has decreased dramatically, and consequently the demand for saw timber-sized trees has also decreased. Now, based on severance tax data, the amount of pine saw timber harvested in 2011 was down 23.4% compared to the previous five years period's average, and hardwood saw timber harvest decreased by 24.8%. So obviously, if, you know, when trees aren't being cut, they continue to grow and add to overall timber volume. Okay. What about uh, how the economy has affected forest landowners and the industry? Well, generally speaking, uh, the poor economy has had a, a negative impact on Alabama's forest landowner and industry over the past few years. Now, while the pulp and paper industry is doing relatively well, your mills that produce solid wood products, such as sawmills and veneer mills, they've been hit pretty hard. Um, due to a greatly reduced demand for lumber, uh, 2011 pine saw timber prices are at their lowest level since the early 1990s, and oak saw timber prices are at their lowest level since 1996, which obviously is not good news for the forest landowner. Um, also, a number of sawmills have either gone out of business or temporarily closed or have cut back on production over the past few years. Um, now, despite all this negativity uh, associated with the forest products industry, um, it continues to play a major role in Alabama's economy. It is the state's second largest manufacturing industry, producing an estimated $12.78 billion worth of products in 2010 and directly employing almost 47,000 people. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Brian. All right. Thank that. you. Well, that giant sucking sound you hear uh, might just be a kudzu bug that's making an impact and controlling one of our more invasive pests. Jim Hanuel is with the U.S. Forest Service and can fill us in on the details. Welcome, Jim. Well, thank you. This kudzu bug is, is newly arrived to Alabama. What can you tell us about it? Well, uh, it, excuse me, it's a fairly small insect from Asia. It came here from Asia. It's about the size of a pencil eraser and uh, was first discovered in a uh, nine-county area east of Atlanta. But since then, it's spread over most of the south, uh, including the eastern half of Alabama. So it's spread uh, rapidly in a very short period of time, which is kind of surprising. It's a uh, close relative of stink bugs, and like stink bugs, when it's disturbed, it produces kind of a nasty odor. Does it look like a stink bug? No, nah, it's kind of <clears throat> more uh, more squat and <clears throat> excuse me, and smaller in shape. So no, not not really a okay. All right, go ahead. And um, it's called the kudzu bug because that's that's what it feeds on. It feeds uh, on kudzu and its relatives, and that's and it's kudzu where it builds up uh, really large populations. Uh, and like stink bugs, it uh, it feeds by sucking uh, the juices out of plants. Uh, okay, not, uh, how does that uh, sucking the juice out of plant? I've had it. How does that affect the plant specifically? Well, that's a that's a good question, and, and it's one of the great things about this insect is that it's having a big impact on kudzu. We did a little study where we we sprayed kudzu and uh, protected it from from the insects, and, and then had other areas that were unprotected, so they could eat all they wanted. And and after one year, they uh, reduced the amount of kudzu by 33 percent. So if it can do that year in and year out, it's going to have a, a big effect on kudzu's ability to. Uh, to be competitive and to exclude other plants from from uh, uh, kudzu pashas. So all, all that sounds great uh, to people that don't like kudzu, but um, some people want to get rid of the bug. Yeah, you're right, and uh, one of the reasons is because uh, it's attracted to white, and in the in the fall of the year when it's looking for overwintering sites, it ends up on and in people's houses. So they don't. That doesn't make them very happy. It's so you're uh, talking about white surfaces, the color white. Right, right. So, so if you have a white house or a white siding, uh, it, it's going to go for the for a white house, and um, that makes people unhappy. Uh, probably the, the main problem with it is that it's um, it moves into soybeans in June and July. So a large number of insects uh, migrate from from kudzu to soybeans, where it uh, can cause up to a 20% yield loss. Now, there's there's uh, research by Philip Roberts uh, in Georgia that shows that it can be controlled with insecticides, but um, 
it's still uh, an added cost that soybean growers aren't very happy about. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Jim. Uh, we appreciate the contribution. Well, trees produce a variety of, of useful products and renewable products. Uh, one of those products is nuts. The Northern Nut Growers Association is, is not surprisingly, a group dedicated to learning more about growing nuts. And we've asked Dennis Fulbright to comment on this organization. Hello, Dennis. Hi. What is this uh, Northern Nut Growers Association? What does it do? Well, we're about a hundred, more than a hundred years old. We were founded in 1906, and. Regardless of the name, forget the northern part of it. We're really just supporting nut growers, private nut growers, who uh, small hobbyists to large landowners who want to grow nuts. Uh, the northern part of it was because I think originally back in the early 20s and 30s and that era, and even into the 60s, they were trying to push the pecan tree further north. There were small patches of uh, pecan biomass in northern Missouri and uh, in Nebraska, and they were trying to move those even further north to the Mississippi River Valley. And, yeah. So anyone anyone can join. Don't have to be a northern nut grower, right? They don't have to be in the north, and we have a lot of people in the south. And pecan is sort of the king of the mm -hmm. uh, of the of the nuts. Uh, but uh, we're uh, we we in Michigan, where I'm from here, we have uh, a big chestnut industry that's starting up to uh, help. Uh, uh, the people grow. Uh, basically, uh, nuts are uh, you know one of the healthiest things you can eat if you remind yourself the mm -hmm. calories. The nutrition's fantastic. You just ca can't overeat on the calories. Uh, good, the fats they have are the good fats, and they have a, a nut like chestnut that has no fats, basically very few fats. You guys have published a book on growing nut trees in North America. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, this is a fantastic book. This really, I mean, you, when you're born into the world and there's nut industries, you don't really think about how they got started. But uh, this book called The Guide to Nut Tree Culture in North America uh, covers most of the nut trees. It doesn't do the walnuts. That'll be another volume. But it covers the hickories, the pecans, chestnuts, the hazelnuts, uh, and how to grow them, cultivars, establishment. And, and this book is... It, we, History chapter, and you'll just find out. Okay. Do you have a favorite? Do you have a favorite chapter? I think my favorite chapter ended up being the hickories because uh, they're overlooked a lot. And uh, L.J. Grauke from uh, from uh, uh, Texas uh, runs the uh, the, uh, the uh, farm down there. He has written a fantastic chapter on all the hickory species. <laughs> Uh, it's the, the the ones you never have heard of before. He's got a you know he's got a pages on them. It's a fantastic uh, hickory reference. And of course, there's two chapters on pecans. One by Tommy Thompson from Texas also, and and uh, he just talks about pecans and the different cultivars. And then there's another one, and again, expanding pecans into the Midwest. <laughs> but right. I think that's going pretty slow. I don't think anyone needs to worry about that in the South. Right. We'll provide a, a link to how you can get that book. Thank you, Dennis. We appreciate right. that. Mm -hmm. Technology is changing the way that businesses operate, and that's no less true of forestry. We've invited Roger Bryant with Genesis Forest Management to help us learn about some new applications. Hello, Roger. Hey, hey glad to be here today. How is mobile technology changing the way that we practice forestry? Well, we're able to collect more data in the woods uh, than ever before, and uh, from being able to identify a tree using the camera, on your phone or tablet to measuring tree heights. We're really breaking the ice on what we can do now with today's smartphones and tablets. Uh, you know, mostly what we run are Android and iOS, but Windows is entering, uh, Microsoft is entering the, the tablet market this fall with uh, the Microsoft service, Surface. I'm really excited about that. Um, you know, today's smartphones and tablets are, are you know, more robust. They have great power large selection of apps, they're easy to use, touch-friendly, a lot more affordable, and there's just a, a great number of devices available these days. Uh, you know, I remember my first GPS unit, it cost over $5,000, and uh, with, you know, software, another another 1000 on top of that. Uh, today, you can buy, you know, a nice smartphone or a tablet, you know, a smartphone on contract for less than 300 a tablet, tablet less than 500 and your know, apps can range anywhere from free up to you know two hundred fifty dollars for a really nice complete GIS application. Uh, if, if someone's interested in buying a smartphone or a tablet, do you have a recommendation on on what you like? 
Well, I do, and, and you know, I usually say it depends, but, uh, you know, the, the iPad and, and I, you know, iPhone products through Apple are really nice. Uh, they do have some disadvantages that Apple limits what they can do uh, sometimes, like, for example, collect, co- connecting an Android or a uh, Bluetooth GPS receiver. You can do that on Android but not on iOS. Uh, as far as Android users go, uh, you know, Samsung Galaxy Nexus is a nice phone, the Samsung Galaxy S3. And as far as the tablet, Google just released a tablet called the Nexus 7, which is a really nice uh, small 7-inch tablet. Um, like I said, later this year, Microsoft is uh, releasing a 10-inch tablet called the Surface um, that I'm really, really excited about. I can't wait to see it, and I think it's going to be a game changer and uh, the iPad probably best competition out there. All right, talk to us about the new apps that are out there. Well, you know, I mentioned Leaf Snap uh, earlier, but it's a really cool app that you can actually be in the woods and you can actually take a picture of a leaf, and then the app will help you determine what the species of that tree is. Uh, GeoCam, uh, free and pro on Android, allow you to take geotagged pictures that will uh, allow you to pull them up on, on Google Maps or Google Earth. Um, so you could take a picture of, like, a deer stand or, a, a, you know, a food plot on your property. Um, that that app also allows you to calculate app or calculate the heights of a tree, um, which is really uh, an awesome feature. Um, GPS area calculation on Android allows you to uh, take GPS data around, say, a field or a clear-cut area, and uh, you can calculate the acreage or export uh, that data over to GIS software. And there's some really neat GIS software out there, some really full uh, feature packages. Uh, some of those include ArcGIS, uh, GIS Kit, Wolf GIS, or CMT GIS, uh, available on, you know, some on Android, some on iOS. But you know, for more information, you can check out my blog at forestgeek.com. All right. Well, thank you, Roger. Now, we wanted to uh, touch base with Eric St. Clair, who was with us at the last annual meeting. He's with the State Oil and Gas Board, and he's been busy working on online maps that uh, should prove very useful. Welcome back, Eric. Oh, well, thank you. Is there a way that landowners can utilize these online mapping systems that you're working on to determine if there's oil and gas activity uh, near their land? Uh, Yes, there is. Uh, Once a a landowner can launch our online map system, uh, it will take them uh, to the main application that will display the state as a whole on the screen. And... um, there's a series of tools at the top of the of the screen that will let them work with the map, and one of those in particular is the the find an address tool. Uh, I found that a lot of the landowners are, are quick to know the, an address, but you know they may not be as quick to know the township rain section mm-hmm. uh, of their land. And once they run that tool, uh, they'll be able to enter it and zoom in to their location. Okay, um, this is an idea that the coal miners might uh, pick up on too. I don't know if they have a similar type thing that you're doing to find out where coal mining is taking place. Um, what about uh, if you find out that there is activity, how can you determine how much activity uh, is taking place in these wells? Well, th- there's a couple of ways. We, uh, you can do it either through the online maps or uh, through a regular you know, text-based database search from our website. Uh, from the online mapping system, uh, once you zoom in and determine that, or, or not determine, uh, that there are wells uh, near or around your property, um, you'll be able to physically see them. And when you launch the uh, the database search tool, uh, you, you'll be able to select a, to, to select a well, and then there will be a, a a link that you will be able to click on that you can view the well production, and you can see how much uh, oil or gas it produced, and and the dates it did, and, uh, and and things like that. Okay, some of us still like hard copies of things like maps and stuff. Is it possible to get something like that? It is. One of the most popular features of our uh, online mapping system is is the ability to export uh, what you're looking at on the screen as a PDF. And what it does is it takes the image and puts it into a, a predetermined layout of, of pa- different page sizes. Some people would want a letter size or some people may want a legal or, or various sizes like that. And they can take and hit hit the uh, the print tool um, at the very top up there, and they can enter a title in and hit the button, and it will create a, a PDF for them or a, a JPEG or whichever format they choose. And then they can take that and print it out, and it will look uh, really professional. It will look like it's done uh, within an ArcGIS application. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Eric. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. 
And our markets chair is longtime board member and CPA Henry Barclay, whose firm is celebrating its 100th year in business. He's alerted us to a focus the IRS has on whether certain deductions are going to be considered legitimate business deductions. Welcome, Henry. Hey there, Hayes. I understand that the IRS has a new initiative that could affect forest landowners. What is it? It does. Uh, There's some storm clouds that are gathering on the horizon. uh, There's a section called 183 that deals with hobby losses, and for a number of years the service has been uh, prepping its agents to do examinations under this uh, section and its regulations. And essentially what it does is that it can IRS can determine that a forest landowner who reports his income either on a Schedule C as a business, a Schedule F as a farm, or even as an investor, might actually have a hobby. And if he has a hobby, it makes most of his replantation and silvicultural expenses non-deductible. And this could be a huge blow. Just just getting the letter from the IRS that there's an assertion that there's an audit coming and that your uh, your Schedule C expenses might uh, be lost is bad enough. So just to set this up, uh, hobby losses are not deductible. That's, that's bad news. Uh, you want to be considered a business in order to be able to legitimately deduct these, these uh, expenses? Yes, you can, either, you can either be a business or you can be a more passive investor. If you're an investor, you, your expenses are typically deducted on your Schedule A itemized deductions, and you lose some of those in miscellaneous itemized deductions where most of them, your silvicultural expenses would fall. But a, a lot of landowners, and I think most landowners, report either a Schedule C or Schedule F. Okay. Uh, what do you recommend to do about this? Um and, and how, how to respond to it? Yeah, well, the the uh, the target is really taxpayers who have income or loss reported through uh, S corporations, partnerships, or C's, that type of thing that show losses. Mm-hmm. And the issue is that that as landowners, we're not going to show gains mm-hmm. on our Schedule C's or F because all of our gains come as cap as uh, Section forty seven ninety seven or se- or, or capital or uh, capital mm-hmm. gains. Mm-hmm which end up on Schedule D. So we'll have a Schedule D gain and a Schedule C or F loss. So there are nine factors that the IRS evaluates to make their determination, which really should be known to every timber owner. And We've got those prepared. listed uh, next to your image on the screen. Sure do. Oh, great. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great place to, to go look. You need uh, items like uh, whether books and records are maintained, whether you've uh, experienced have expertise that's employed intent to make a profit presence of management plan that's a big one having a management plan is very important and if there's a if there's material there is material in that article and uh, people can go to it i think this is an area where preparation is a really good issue and I would stress uh, what my scout leader said, be prepared. You know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure in this in this particular area. So be prepared for the questions that are going to come. They're not hard questions necessarily to answer, and there may be uh, some adjustments you might want to make as a landowner in how you're accounting for your activities that will make you bulletproof. So let's get bulletproof. That's the best thing to be. All right. Thank you, Henry. We appreciate that. And that's all the time we have for this issue. Our thanks go to Sterling Burnett, Jack Lutz, Brian Hendricks, and Jim Hanula. We also appreciate the contributions of Dennis Fulbright, Roger Bryant, Eric St. Clair, and Henry Barclay. With the tragic consequences of the wildfires out west, many people whose lives are affected and property threatened are demanding answers. Certainly much credit goes to those brave individuals who risk their lives to put out the fires. But what are the conditions that contribute to wildfires? Some people point to the lack of harvesting by the owner of these forests, Uncle Sam. Under pressure by environmentalists to halt logging, many of these areas have become tender boxes. Harvesting can create better conditions to prevent fires, and that's something that some forest owners have known for a long time. On behalf of the Alabama Forest Owners Association, I'm Hayes Brown. Thank you for joining us for this issue of Capital Ideas Live.